Uh, well, thank you for that very kind introduction, Christine. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you for Richard uh, and the home team and Andrew and the musicians and technical team, including Tom here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great honor for me to, um, to have this day. When I was growing up, one of my godparents gave me a framed copy of Rudyard Kipling's poem, If which I dutifully placed on my wall. It's a poem from another era of muscular Christianity steeped in stoicism. It has celebrated lines like, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, but also absurd sentiments like, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you. It concludes with the less remembered beatitude, yours is the earth, and everything that's in it, and of course the hopelessly chauvinist and unreconstructed climax, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. <laughs> the poem's imperial shortcomings are exacerbated when you realize it was written in tribute to Leander Starr Jameson, whose notorious 1895 Jameson raid was a contributing factor to the Boer War and a low point, among many low points, in colonial history. But for all its flaws, the poem offers a suitable structure for how to preach. Here's a riff on Rudyard to get us started this morning. If you can move the heart of every listener with words of life and tragedy and joy, if you can touch on trials, fears, and anger, yet soar to heights no doubt can e'er destroy, if you can course the veins of scripture and find the lifeblood bubbling through as new, if you can paint a proud and vivid picture that stirs the soul to efforts good and true, if you can search yet share what you've discovered, if you can, bless, you can express compassion, insight, care, blending your questions, mysteries uncovered, delving to griefs as deep as you can dare, if you explore the gut, the sharpest points of panic with tender, generous touch of truth, if you can recognize the times we feel so manic, merging the sage of ages with the thrill of youth, if you can stay with pain yet not go on forever, if you can pinpoint hope and make the soul expand, if you can aim for wisdom, not just being clever, with logic mounted up, yet not too overplanned, you can speak the Spirit's words like Pentecost. You can raise the roof like those in Galilee. You will find a way to seek and save the lost, and in time, you'll find it comes naturally. Preaching is a duty, but it really should be a joy. In the words of the 19th century American folk song popularized by Enya, your disposition should be one of how can I keep from singing. I'm going to offer now a sermon designed to get the congregation singing too. <clears throat> I often talk about the four features of head, heart, hand, and gut, and say a sermon generally starts with the head and to be effective needs to touch on the gut. This sermon is unusual for me because the gut parts are authentically in the text rather than being connections made out of the text. It's a bold attempt to get the congregation excited not just by the implications or applications of the text, but by the text itself. For that reason, I include more signpost material than usual to ensure the congregation stays alert to the text rather than wait for any analogies or narratives that spin out of it. The sermon is on the passage that Richard read for us in our morning worship just now, on the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. When I go walking in the hills, I always stay in the same little cabin. It has no connection to the national gas supply or electricity grid, and it's practically a single room. There's a great view out the window, but often the clouds completely obscure it. The sofa and two chairs are all pointed in the direction of the single source of heat, which is a wood-burning stove. The stove sits in the corner on four curved feet and has a glass door. It's designed to maximize every ounce of energy in the logs 
So once everything's really caught alight, the fire goes silent and the flames lick in every direction. I call it the TV because the glass door is like a screen in the corner and the spectacle is mesmerizing and you can stare into it and lose yourself in it for hours. Exodus chapter 3 is about a fire. A fire appears unexpectedly but compellingly in the desert. The fire is mesmerizing. The fire never goes out. But here's the big reveal in the story. The fire is God. The story is about who God is and what God wants for us. It turns out it's the whole Bible in 15 verses. I want today to look closely at some of the details of this story because in those details I believe we find the answer to perhaps life's two biggest questions. Who is God and what does God want for us? Listen closely because I believe the answer this story gives to those two questions will set you on fire. I'm going to give you four words that crystallize people's negative perceptions of who God is. The first is distant. God seems preoccupied with things or people other than us. Then inscrutable. It's impossible to follow God's logic. Next, contrastingly, controlling. Those who maintain everything happens for a reason portray God as an extreme micromanager. Last, vengeful. God seems to have a lot of wrath and an inexplicable dislike for some kinds of people. These four words aren't consistent, but I suspect they're comprehensive in articulating why people distrust, reject, or even hate God. Now just look at what we discover in the story of Moses and the burning bush. God isn't distant. God is intense and close. God isn't inscrutable. God speaks and explains and persuades and reveals. God isn't controlling. It's Moses that's going to do the work. God isn't vengeful. God is about setting us free. All of those transformative discoveries are contained in this simple, astonishing realization. God is on fire. God is on fire with love, liberating, mesmerizing, empowering, intoxicating. God is on fire with love for you. That's a totally exhilaratingly different understanding of God. This is an overwhelming, thrilling, absorbing notion of God. Fire can give heat and warmth. Fire can give light and illumination. Yet fire can also be devastating and destructive. But the fire Moses sees isn't that last kind. How do we know? Because we're told the, the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. The fire that is God is hot and enlightening, but not in the business of destruction. It enfolds, but doesn't consume. It enlivens, but doesn't engulf. It licks, but doesn't bite. Now, we discover the two fundamental things about who God is. The first comes in the simple repetition of a name, Moses, Moses. What does this tell us? It tells us God already knows our name. Out of the myriad peoples on earth, past, present, future, out of the infinite complexity of the universe, God knows your name. God, the blazing fire, loves every single one of us, but loves each one of us as if we were the only one. But it also tells us God from the very outset is seeking to be in relationship with us. God starts a conversation. God is looking for companionship. God is wrapped up in our world, our life, our identity, our purpose. God is essentially, originally, and always about relationship. The second fundamental thing arises when we start to engage with the context of this story, the backdrop against which this conversation takes place. God is especially eager to be in relationship with those who are downfallen and downtrodden. Moses is downfallen. He was prince of Egypt, exalted in Pharaoh's court, yet he killed a man, fell from grace, found himself in the wilderness and is disconsolate, depressed, and disheveled. The Hebrews, meanwhile, 
are downtrodden. They are in misery in Egypt. They cry out in their sufferings. They labor under their taskmasters, for they are slaves. What does God, the blazing fire, say to Moses and to Moses about the Hebrews? Just look at the concatenation of verbs. God sees, God sees their misery. God hears, God hears their cries. God knows, God knows their sufferings. Nothing the slightest bit distant, inscrutable, controlling, or vengeful here. This is a real relationship where God doesn't just look but sees and perceives. God doesn't just hear but listens and appreciates. God doesn't just know but learns and understands. This is what we call paying attention. The blazing fire of God's love isn't just about doing and ordering. It's about perceiving, appreciating, understanding. It's a truly two-way relationship. But now behold the truly astonishing two verbs that complete this sequence. We've had see, hear, know. We're beginning to comprehend that the blazing fire of God's love knows our name, wants to be in relationship with us, and especially with those of us who are downfallen or downtrodden. Now just get ready for the remarkable two verbs that follow. Here's one. I have come down. Focus on those two words, come down. For Christians, they mean one thing and one thing only, they mean Jesus. Jesus is God come down. Jesus is God who makes a two-way relationship with us. Jesus is God who sees us, hears us, knows us. Jesus is the blazing fire of God's love. What these words meant when they were written, maybe in the 6th century BC, I have no idea. But what these words mean for Christians, I have no doubt. Jesus is God saying, I have come down. And before you've digested the wonder of that, the wonder of Jesus planted right in the middle of the story of Moses and the burning bush, just get yourself ready for the last of the five verbs of God's announcement to Moses. Here it is. Bring them up. It sounds like a geographical reference. It sounds like going down is going south to Egypt and bringing them up is bringing them north or at least northeast to Canaan, the holy land, the promised land. But to you and me, to anyone who's just discovered the dynamite that's in the phrase, I have come down, these words mean far more than that. They mean I will raise up. If I have come down means incarnation, I will raise up means resurrection. Why did Jesus come down? To be in relationship with us and share our downfallenness and downtroddenness. Why did Jesus rise up to raise us to life in relationship with Father, Son, and Spirit forever? We've stumbled on the whole gospel and we're only three chapters into the second book of the Bible. But I told you this story was going to set you on fire. And that's because we haven't yet even reached the best bit. We've discovered God is on fire with love for us. We've seen that God longs to be in relationship most of all with the downfallen and downtrodden. We've realized that God's two-way relationship means perceiving, appreciating, understanding. We found that Jesus' mission to come down among us and to raise us up to be with God are right there in the DNA of the Old Testament, the beginning of the Exodus story. What more could there be? I'll show you. Moses has two complaints to God. Complaint one is, I can't do this. Complaint two is, I don't even know your name. Now get ready for what we discover when God responds to these two questions. When we learn God's name, it is... I am who I am. It's the essence of existence. It's that thread that links earthly existence to eternal essence. It's being itself. Now let's turn to what we find when God transforms Moses' inadequacy and isolation. God says, I will be with you. What the English doesn't tell you but is the key to the whole story and the whole of the Christian faith is that the word for God's identity, I am who I am, and the word for God's action, I am with you, is the same word. 
So to say being and to say with and to say God is to utter three words that mean the same thing. God discloses God's identity in the word being and God's purpose in the word with. Behold what these 15 verses of the third chapter of Exodus tell us. Who is God? God is being, the essence that brings forth existence, the love that engulfs but doesn't consume, the fire ablaze with love for us. What does God want? God wants to be with us. God wants to be with us in our downfallenness and our downtroddenness. God's name is being. God's purpose is with. God's identity is being with us. Sit down in one of those chairs or that sofa. Stare into that wood-burning stove. Be enfolded by the flames that enliven and enlighten but don't engulf. Be entranced by the fire of love that never goes out. Be mesmerized by the God who is being. Be thrilled by the God who longs to be with. Put away all those false and diminishing notions of God. You found out who God really is. The one whose being is forever and whose with is utter and who never wants to be unless that being is with you. Those familiar with my preaching will know that I'm never happier than when I can say it turns out it's the whole Bible in 15 verses. <laughs> and I never enjoy preaching more than when I can communicate something I've only just discovered myself. The danger when preaching about an over-familiar passage, like for example the prodigal son, is that you seldom get this freshly minted feel. Which is one of the reasons why after 32 years of preaching I'm still generally looking to preach on passages I haven't addressed before. I can't pretend this is the first sermon I've preached on Exodus 3, but I do want to make a plea, as I do at greater length, in a book called How to Preach, that you may now be familiar with, <laughs> for preaching frequently on the Old Testament. There tend to be three assumptions about the Old Testament. One is, it's mostly good as a source of prophecies about the New Testament. That's what I call the nine lessons and carols heresy. Another is, it's all too complicated and full of unpronounceable names who begat each other. <laughs> A third is, it's full of smiting and wrath, and it's immoral to read it. In fact, that third view, which is technically known as Marcionism, after the second century heretic from Sinope on the Black Sea coast on, in modern Turkey, whose canon included Paul's writings and a bowdlerized version of Luke, popped up in contemporary form when I first preached this sermon. A learned member of the congregation insisted it was inappropriate to preach on this passage without considering God's murderous purpose for the Egyptians later in Exodus, and similar intent towards the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and indeed the use of the Bible in the ideology of the State of Israel today. Now let me be clear, I think there's an important place for reflecting theologically on the state of Israel, even in a sermon, and also on the moral status of the God who is portrayed as slaughtering the peoples who enslaved or rivaled Israel in the early books of the Old Testament. My two provisos are that the sermon must always be good news, not an analytical essay, and that it remains valid to render the power of a Gentile realizing Israel's scriptures can speak transformatively to me today. If we find a passage challenging, that's not a reason never to preach on it or to excise it from the Bible, but to listen to it even more carefully than usual, just as we would to a beloved friend who was speaking or behaving in a way that seemed troubling or out of character. I do preach from time to time about political and social issues, including controversial ones, but I earn the right to do so by majoring on sermons that seek, as this one does, to bring the congregation face to face with God. Perhaps the biggest mistake is to try to do too many things at the same time and end up doing none of them satisfactorily. Let me take you through what I'm trying to do in this sermon. 
It started with realizing that I am what I am is the same verb as I will be with you. Hebrew has only two tenses, and in my first draft, I made a play of helping the congregation realize how that fact alters the Old Testament's sense of time. But I decided to delete that part of the sermon as distracting. Instead, I structured the sermon as a layer cake building up from one revelation to another. The clinching moment was when I realized the significance of the two verbs, I have come down and I will bring up. Now I really had a cascade of discoveries to share, one that thrilled me so much I decided to include the sense of excitement in the structure of the sermon. It's a big risk to say something as bold as I believe the answer this story gives to those two questions will set you on fire. I showed the sermon to a friend ahead of time and she said she thought the build-up was over the top and ran counter to my usual understated persona. <laughs> But I stood my ground, and the reaction to the sermon made me feel vindicated. <laughs> the verbal cues, like we haven't yet even reached the best bit, and what you could call the spoken colons, like here it is, are all ways of ensuring the congregation doesn't miss the power of what I'm trying to communicate by getting lost in the argument or losing concentration some other way. You need always to remember that spoken English is significantly different from written English, and even if you're preparing a written manuscript, you need to learn to imitate the way we talk to each other when we've got something thrilling to say. Once I've worked out what's going to be the big reveal, there remain two major steps to make before I begin to write. The first is, what is the major existential question facing every single person listening that I'm seeking to speak into? If there's no such question, I have to ask myself if I'm just offering an interesting lecture or idle entertainment. If there's something unsatisfactory about this sermon, it's that I identify not one but two such questions. Who is God and what does God want for us? And two is generally one too many, <clears throat> because it's hard to hold two in your head throughout the sermon, so as to have them in mind when I come to the climax. But on this occasion, I stuck to two because the big reveal is the twofold discovery that I am who I am and I will be with you are intrinsically linked. The last step before I commit word to screen is to locate something enticing, inviting and engaging with which to lead the congregation into the world of the sermon in just two or three sentences so everyone's completely with me straight away before I get to the existential territory. I chose the wood-burning stove because it's a fire and because it's absorbing in the way God is absorbing. Notice while I give it three or four sentences to ensure everyone's completely with me, I don't overshare details like where the cabin is or how difficult it is to light the fire <laughs> because such details would delay and distract us from getting to the point of the introduction, which is the mesmerizing power of fire. So that's how I preach on a passage like Exodus 3. If you get the sermon ready a week ahead of time, you can choose music like Go Down Moses or God's Going to Set the World on Fire to complete the effect. I wrote my book, How to Preach, to share these kinds of insights and thus inspire preachers near and far to reflect on their own practice and make it the best it can be. And for the same reason, we organized today's event not so others should preach the way I do, but that all of us should share the thrill and the wonder of hearing God speak today. Okay, we've got, I think we've got um, some time. Uh, I can't remember, are we finishing at 20 past or something like that? So, um, do a bit of Q&A? Yeah. Time for, I, I, I should have said at the beginning, there will be time for Q&A after all the sessions today. Um, and if you're online, you can post your questions and comments in the comment bar. And we have a, another technical wizard outside who's monitoring those and will run in with messages uh, from our online audience. If you'd like to make a comment or ask Sam a question, um, please stay where you are and raise your hand. We have roving microphones and we will come to you. But Thank you, Sam. You can see what I meant about there being no other possible speaker to open our festival of preaching events. So, okay. Um, 
here's the roving microphone. So who wants to kick off? Hi, Sam. Uh, oh, that's loud. Um, as a second year curate, um, I'm very keen to get the length of my sermons right. And everybody I speak to says something slightly different. What do you think is the right kind of length? Is, is 45 minutes too long? <laughs> and five minutes too short? I think make the most of being a curate. The downside of being a curate is that you are constantly patronized. The upside of being constantly patronized is that you can experiment. It doesn't have to be the same every time. You can try a few different styles. Um, I'm a big believer in showing sermons to other people before I preach them. I, I still do that almost every time I preach. Uh, a second opinion is always great. And one of the questions you, it's very important when you're asking for feedback that you tell people what kind of feedback you want. <laughs> and could, could, could I have said this just as well or better in fewer words is, is a very helpful kind of feedback. You know, that, that extra paragraph about what you felt about England losing the rugby on Saturday is actually personally quite interesting, but totally irrelevant to the sermon. So. I think you could leave that one out and just chat to people about that over coffee, don't you? You know, that kind of feedback is really helpful. Um, so I, I'd, I'd resist saying there's an optimum length because we, we had uh, Rory Stewart speak upstairs last night, 800 people, and it was absolutely mesmerizing. And he went on 45 minutes. I'd have been more than happy if he'd gone on for another half an hour. And if, if you're as good as he is, time is really pretty well irrelevant. Um, very few people, however, will come up to you after a sermon and say, you know, that was fantastic, but there was only one thing wrong with it, it was too short. You don't get that kind of feedback. <laughs> <laughs> so the truth is we could almost all say, almost everything we say more succinctly than we do. in preparing a sermon. The important thing, as I tried to outline uh, when I described the preparation, is that you have got something, whether it's, the, uh, whether it's the heart of the sermon or not, you've got to have something that really tickles the mind, that really engages, that's cure, that's interesting, I never thought of that. How about that? Whether in the passage or in the li life outside the passage that makes the passage come to life, and you actually, almost always, I wouldn't say always, but almost always, the bit that people remember for the sermon isn't your one-liner, but how they felt uh, halfway through. And how they felt halfway through is about the gut, because we remember how the gut feels. Uh, and and you, if you get those two bits right, you know, length is really, nobody's going to remember oh, we have the new curate, and her sermon was 13 minutes this week, because last week it was 11 and a half. No one's going to remember that. They're going to remember, did you hit the gut? Did you exercise the mind? Did you move the heart? Did you empower the hand? Those are the four questions. Uh, oh, well, I'm not in control. <laughs> Go on. Thank you. So, um, Mm, in your magisterial example here, there is that I could appreciate that connection of coming down and rising up with incarnation and resurrection as a very strong uh, aspect of, of the message. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit on jumping from the exegesis of a text onto other biblical connections of Christological nature, uh, which is not perhaps always welcome because it could be potentially seen as you disregarding the contextual text and just bringing Jesus into the discourse. Just bringing Jesus into the, I mean, <laughs> just bringing Jesus into the Bible. Okay, guilty. Uh, although I don't think I am. Um, 
you know, this, this is really where I think a whole generation of theological te teachers have failed the church. I'll be as sweeping and bald as that. And I think it's a generation of theological teachers from about 1960 through to about 1995, broadly speaking, who um, tended to take the historical critical method, who tended to, to say we've got to read the Old Testament as a Hebrew Bible and it's got to read it as, as it was speaking to the Jews at the time of writing. These are things that literature lecturers and, and academics would never say of any other text. They would say, what does the text mean today? They would say, the authors died, the, 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 the text lives beyond the text in the lives created by its readers. But for some reason, people still insist on saying that about the Bible. The, the Bible was written, most of it, the Old Testament, was written, as I understand it, in the exile as Israel came to terms with the catastrophe of how I would put it, and you'll understand my language if you're not familiar with my other work, you'll understand it from what I shared today. They said goodbye to the God of four, who was really about making blessings, manufacturing blessings for Israel, and they said hello to the God of with, who was together with them even in their, their darkest hour. Um, and so I think it's <clears throat> completely legitimate to draw a pretty straight and not very dotted line from the experience of Israel finding God with them paradoxically in exile more than God had ever been with them in land, king and temple in the promised land, to draw that straight line to the cross where the disciples found paradoxically that God was with them in the crucified Jesus uh, more even than in Galilee or in uh, you know, happy times like the feeding of the 5,000 and so on. So that, you know, that seems to me the insight that's at the epicenter of the Bible. So to look back and find two verbs in Exodus that reflect that transition, recognizing this was probably written down in the exile too, seems to me utterly legitimate. In fact, obligatory for Christians. I don't, I, I'm not saying that every sermon on uh, an Old Testament passage must have a Christological twist. It's, it's not about forcing Jesus into the text, but when you read something, and you think, hello, he came down. He will bring them up. Tick, 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 ding-a-ling-a-ling. -ling. You know, so you're reading the text with a Christological magnifying glass in your eye. And if you bring it out for the benefit of the congregation, you are, that's the reason they pay you the big bucks. <laughs> Okay, time for, for a few more. Yeah. Um, I know you start your sermon prep early because of the online things you do and things like that, and I guess all of us have different start days for when we start preparing. But at what point do you lock your sermon? Do you wake up on a Sunday morning and say, let's listen to the news and see how that's going to shape, or do you say, no, I've locked it on whatever day it is, it's not changing, regardless of what happens on Strictly or Rugby <laughs> or whatever? Or at what point do you say, actually, God can still speak to me as I'm preaching? Does that ever change what you're saying as compared to what you've written? I don't privilege whatever thoughts I had, disconsolate as I might be about the rugby the previous night, uh, on Sunday morning. I do privilege the slow and careful work guided by the Holy Spirit that I've done usually on the Friday. I usually write sermons nine days before kickoff. Um, gives me time to share to, when we have our ministers and musicians meeting on Monday morning. I can talk to the choir director about what I'm going to be saying. I can send the sermon to the person leading the intercessions. You know, the music can be chosen, the intercessions can be chosen, the whole service can be shaped as, as I said, you know, God's going to set this world on fire, I think was the, the um, anthem that followed this when I preached it. But, but that, would only, that couldn't have happened if I'd woken up Saturday morning having watched Strictly the night before. I, I, I just simply don't want to put myself <laughs> under the kind of pressure that somehow between the hours of six and eight on a Sunday morning, I will have insight that's not available to me 
Uh, you know, it's a team game. Litur liturgy is a team game. Other people are leading prayers, other people are leading music. If I'm taking their ministry seriously, I've got to empower them. And if I want the sermon to be, you know, the main event, as it were, or a significant part of the liturgy, I've, I've got to organize my life and my preparation accordingly. Um, there are other ways to accommodate things that happen. So I can remember I preached on June the 26th, uh, 2016. And I'd prepared a sermon, uh, a couple of members of the congregation, including quite a long-standing members of the congregation, it was their last Sunday before being ordained, the following Sunday, to serve a ministry in another church. I'd prepared a sermon on Elijah and Elisha and the mantle falling on Elisha. I was quite pleased with the sermon. It seemed extremely appropriate, particularly for the person who, you know, hesitated about going forward for ordination and then finally gone forward. Wonderful gift to the church. Um, I, I, I could not ignore the fact that the Brexit vote had gone through three days before. So I prepared maybe a minute and a half, two minute remarks, began the service with a response to the Brexit um, vote and its implication, obviously massive for this community with 25 different nationalities on the staff. Um, couldn't walk away from that, but too raw to preach a whole sermon on that. I suspect if I had preached a whole sermon on that, I might have used some language I might have wanted to step back from later because I was pretty raw about it, very raw about it. So doing an opening, you know, that sense of people coming to church saying, I wonder what people are going to say about the Brexit vote is dealt with straight away, just as having the confession at the beginning of the liturgy deals with the ghastly thing that you did on Monday straight away. <clears throat> and then people can relax. And then people can enjoy the sermon as an encounter with God rather than a kind of Sunday newspaper editorial. Uh, and I'm absolutely convinced that the point of a sermon is to bring people face to face with God rather than to, uh, to be a Sunday newspaper editorial from the pulpit. However much many, of, many congregations will somehow expect it to be the preacher's opportunity to vent, you know, that's the part of the discipline of being in a profession. And being a professional is, is, is not mixing up your own emotions with the role that you're called to perform. Um, I... I I'm firmly convinced the Holy Spirit definitively speaks on Wednesday morning or the previous Friday afternoon. Of course, can sometimes speak spontaneously. But, but why would the Holy Spirit speak in that cavalier manner spontaneously when, when you had created the right shape of your life for the Holy Spirit to speak definitively? Um, I think there is a self-indulgence about saying, I'll see what comes on the day which can be a way of saying, no, I think this congregation and the ministry I've been called to is worth the most careful preparation I can give it. And that's almost never going to be when your mind is full of other things on the Sunday morning or the Saturday night before. I started doing that when I started taking Saturday as a day off, when I had small children. Um, before that, I used to preach extempore, and there would be quite a lot of Saturday night elements, but still not... I think the business of responding to current events can be exaggerated. Just imagine if you'd preached a, um, a Jeremiah of a sermon in response to the Israeli bombing of the Anglican hospital in Gaza on a Sunday, and then the next morning found that most world leaders had said, no, I think this was not actually an Israeli bomb. You know, if you'd given it a week to prepare, that wouldn't, that wouldn't have happened. I think there's a lesson in that. I think we've just time for one last question. Okay. There will be an opportunity later in the day to uh, ask the question that you're, that's burning inside you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm a relatively new LLM, and I can see the beautiful structure of your sermon would lead to the ending of, <laughs> this is who I am, and I've come down for you. I find it really hard to end sermons. I don't know whether to end it by repeating what I said in case people weren't listening right at the beginning or uh, do I enough. put in a bit of poetry because that at least is something which someone else has written. I don't know. And I don't know whether to do 
like action points, you know, see how your neighbour is this week. You know, I don't really want to do that, but I could, lots of people do. So that, that's, how do you end? That's my question. I, I don't start writing the sermon until I know what the last line is going to be. And the whole sermon is shaped in order to get to the last line. So what I, what makes me kind of um, frown is when I hear a sermon where somebody has simply started writing the first paragraph and then sort of run out of steam after about halfway through, you know, because they think this should be an official length. And then and the giveaway line is, and in the epistle, Paul also talks about something similar. Uh-uh. <laughs> that's, that's not the way to do it, in my humble opinion. Um, if you're not really excited about this, then call somebody else on the Tuesday and say, I think I'm not really excited about the Bible of God today, this week, maybe you should have a go. Don't take your under-motivated, you know, just not getting this, nothing much to say, I'll have a look in one of those whole Bible commentaries and see if it's got something to say about the epistle because I've run out of stuff. Don't inflict that on the congregation. The hard work, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, I suppose what I want to stress, because several of you said I'm just starting out, which is fantastic. I've been doing this 32 years. There was an evening back in, I think it was um, May of this year, when I got really, really cross on a Tuesday night. Because I was looking at this passage, I could not get excited about it. Do you know what I did? I worked on it for two and a half hours, and then I slept on it. And the next morning... I felt very differently and saw something and there was maybe something in the news, I can't remember. But it still happens and that's why preachers are very difficult to live with. (laughs) It's okay to be difficult to live with because what you're doing is really important. And until that moment comes when you think, you know, like it did for this in a big way when I spotted that thing, you know, and I needed a commentary to find that. Don't be shy of reading four, five, six commentaries And don't be shy of asking Uncle Jim, who doesn't know what to give you for Christmas, uh, the the latest on Ecclesiastes. It's a thumping good read. That's, you know, that... Get people to give you these commentaries as Christmas presents. I mean, because, you know, when nothing's happening for you, then suddenly you think... You know, I'd I'd even preached about those three verbs, uh, see, know, understand, before, without even noticing the last two verbs. And then I read a commentary that made me think, oh, hello, there's something there. So going back to the commentary, sleeping on it, all of that's fine. But, that, you know, you're arriving at what is the unbelievably fascinating thing about this that I cannot wait to communicate on Sunday and I'm counting the days, and then construct the whole argument around that. I know I disagree with some other people who talk at events like this about my insistence that a sermon is an argument, but I haven't changed my mind. Um, you know, I never end with a nice poem, even a riff on Rudyard Kipling. Um, because what's the, what's the congregation supposed to do with that? Uh, I, I, I want to take the congregation to the mountaintop and then suddenly say, it's the promised land, guys! And then leave them, leave them looking o- over there. Doesn't get better than that for me. D- doesn't always work. Obviously, sometimes a different structure is appropriate. And you'll notice in, in, in the sermon, I did a lot of repetition. I did a lot of, we've seen these two things now, and now actually the third thing. And actually, now we've seen these three things. I often say those bits quite fast, partly because the people who've really been paying attention can do that, but also because it, it, it rhetorically, it, it, it raises the temperature and gets people excited for what number four is going to be. What I try not to do is say, there are five things to say. <laughs> I did hear a preacher once say, eighthly but not finally. (laughs) And I never forget that and make sure I'm never that preacher unless I'm actually making a joke out of it. Um, So, so, uh, yeah, write sermons backwards. Start start with the last line, how you want to leave people, then work out how you're going to get there. I think that's enough from me. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, We now have a a short coffee break. Um, If you can be back here uh, as near to 10.40 as possible uh, for our next speaker. But uh, please thank Sam for an amazing introduction.